All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Morteza Lajanian, and I'm, I have the honor of chairing this uh, second keynote of the format conference uh, today. It is with great honor that I get to introduce our uh, next speaker. She's one of the leaders of the field of applications of formal methods in, um, in robotics and autonomous systems, Yana Tumova. She is an associate professor at the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. She received her PhD in computer science from Masaryk University and was awarded Access Postdoctoral Fellowship at KTH in 2013. She was also a visiting researcher at MIT, Boston University, and Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology. Her research interests include formal methods applied in decision-making, motion planning, and control of autonomous systems. Among other projects, she is a recipient of the Swedish Research Council starting grant to explore compositional planning for multi-agent systems under logic goals and a WASP expeditions project focusing on design of socially acceptable and correct by design autonomous systems. She's also a very good friend and I am very happy that she's here and I'll be listening to her recent work and her vision for the field. Yana, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Morteza. Thanks for the lovely introduction. Um, uh, yeah, do you get to see me, hear me, and do you get to see the slides, the right slides, not the ones uh, one step ahead? Yes, yes, we see Great. The, the good, good things. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot. Um, uh, it's such a such a great honor to be here. And uh, today I would like to uh, share with you some insights into where formal methods can help robot motion planning and uh, what we have achieved so far, where are the opportunities, where are the challenges. So as more as I hinted, uh, my research is some one, somehow one foot in formal methods and one foot in robotics. Usually I talk more to the robotics audience and then I'm there as more as an advocate. Formal methods are, is, are something good, something that you can use. But uh, here I guess that I don't have to defend formal methods so much, uh, but I, I would like to show you where we can um, impact uh, robotics. So I guess most of the audience here, most of you are um, have pretty good idea what formal methods are but maybe you are not so familiar with the term robot motion planning. So let's take a look what that means first. Traditionally, robot motion planning is about planning a motion of a robot from some initial state to a goal state while avoiding obstacles in its environment. So here we have this robot, um, this guy here, and uh, the goal state is really this blue region. The thing that we want to get is basically this trajectory uh, motion. Uh, it is really good to realize that um, uh, that robot is actually a dynamical system and that motion is actually a sequence of control inputs. And that space that the robot lives in is a continuous environment. So um, now the question is how do we solve such a, such a problem, robot motion, uh, planning problem that is about finding a sequence of control inputs for these dynamical systems in a continuous environment. And one way to approach this is to transform this problem into a discrete path planning problem. So uh, within these, this, the transformation to discrete path planning problems, uh, we can take a combinatorial approach. So combinatorial approach built an exact discrete representation, some kind of topological graph that is called a roadmap. So here, for instance, you can see uh, one built uh, via triangulation. So each triangle here is obstacle free. Uh, when you connect a center of, of the triangle to the edge, to the, to the next triangle, that is gonna be obstacle free. So finding a path in this discrete roadmap will give you exactly what, it, what you wanted. This, this will give you the motion. So this is really nice and neat. It's very elegant. It's exact, it's complete. Uh, the thing about these approaches is that it, they are extremely computationally challenging in higher dimensions. And uh, 
often, even though uh, they are elegantly formulated, they are very impractical and very difficult to implement. So that is why we have another family of approaches that try to discretize the problem uh, that are called sampling-based approaches. For instance, here rapidly exploring random trees, RRTs, um, that approach works as follows. You start in an initial state of the robot and um, you randomly sample around that state. While you sample, you connect those samples uh, to that initial state, incrementally building a map, then you sample around uh, the, the samples that you already have in your roadmap and so on and so on. So as you go, the tree grows. And uh, this tree is a roadmap again. These sampling-based approaches are not complete. They don't offer that type of guarantees, but typically they offer some kind of weaker guarantees that are though practical enough. So they can be, for instance, probabilistically complete or resolution complete. And they are much easier to implement. Implementing RRT is a very easy thing to do, and they offer some sort of computational, complex, uh, computational efficiency. Uh, among these approaches, I want to mention one more approach, and that is RRT star. So some sort of optimal-ish version of RRT. I said optimal-ish and not optimal, um, because of course it's not complete, so uh, it cannot be optimal either. Um, here, when you build a tree, while you are building it, you are reconnecting uh, the edges in the tree. So some edges can disappear as you go and are replaced with edges that make the tree um, sort of narrow down, as you see here. Um, very intuitively, um, I'm not going to go into details, but the point is that this uh, uh, RT star is asymptotically optimal. So if you let it run till infinity, you find an optimal path. Um, so, so far it looks kind of robot motion planning. There is some techniques and uh, people have been investigating it for a while, uh, but it's good to realize that that is a really difficult problem to do. Uh, one reason is the size of the workspace, of, of the configuration space. Even though here you see a robot that works really just in 3D, it's got multiple joints and each of these joints uh, brings another dimension in your configuration space. And that is the space where you are planning. So for these robots, uh, some kind of combinatorial op approaches would not work at all. Uh, sampling based approaches would, but you might need to also um, implement some sort of heuristics or uh, some sort of domain knowledge to make it really, really efficient. So uh, size of the problem uh, of a typical motion planning problem is something that is uh, making robot motion planning difficult. Second thing are constraints. So when you build a, a plan, you need to be very sure that you can follow it with, uh, with your robot. What you see on the second video there is a robot that, that, uh, has, uh, that is non-holonomic. That means that it cannot move in every single direction. This is, this is just a car as you know it. Um, it cannot move in every single direction. And these are, these are constraints that you have to consider when you, when you um, make a robot motion plan. Uh, the third one is uncertainty. And here you see a video um, shot a few weeks after I arrived to uh, my robotics postdoc. And I was very surprised how many things in robotics actually don't work. So um, we, had, we had simulations and everything worked perfectly in simulations. We had this now robot that was picking up balls. We had very well-tuned controllers and everything. And then we put the robot in, um, in the environment. And just because it's slightly off, there's a little bit of uncertainty of where things are, a little bit of uncertainty in whether it actually um, um, goes on, on the right uh, tile at the right uh, time. Uh, the robot was sometimes picking the ball and sometimes it was not picking the ball. So we have a lot of uncertainty in robotics that needs to be dealt with. 
And uh, one more uh, uh, reason why robot motion planning is difficult is that when you actually want to do robot motion planning out there in the wild, you get to see a lot of dynamic obstacles. Uh, like here, when you drive with a car on a, on the road, there are other cars, and these are in fact uh, dynamical obstacles. So that is uh, robot motion planning, a uh, difficult, challenging problem on its own. And if I were to summarize what is important uh, for a good robot motion planning algorithm, this is what I think uh, it is. Um, so planning should take reasonable time and resources. So you should be able to come up with a plan quite fast, not to wait too long uh, because your robots need to do stuff. Um, planning should offer reasonable guarantees. It doesn't have to be those perfect guarantees, uh, that perfect completeness. Uh, there could be also probabilistic guarantees or something like that, that will make you trust that this motion planning algorithm will do something good in the end. And then the robots that implement these uh, motion plans should be actually able to execute it. So I'm returning here a little bit back to the non-holonomic robot with the constraints uh, that needs to execute the plan. And if we think about a path in, uh, in an environment generated, for instance, by these combinatorial approaches, it just may, may not be able to execute it if we are not careful about the dynamical constraints. And maybe the robots should be able to do more than just go from A to B. Uh, going from A to B is uh, pretty boring tasks. Maybe they should, uh, why they do that, they need to obey some more sophisticated constraints. They me may need to reach some more sophisticated goals, or they might want to do this. Uh, we might want them to do this uh, in one way or another optimally. So, um, the question is, where can formal methods boost uh, robot motion planning? Uh, one way uh, is that temporal logics used for specifications of goals and constraints um, are rigorous. So there is, when you have a temporal logic specification, there is no ambiguity. Uh, temporal logics are rich. You can express quite a lot of things. You can, of course, express go from A to B, but you can express much, much more things. And they have some resemblance to natural language. Uh, this is a little bit arguable point. But for instance, when I say next do this or in future do this or always do this, uh, it has some resemblance to natural language. So, so that's the three reasons why temporal logics might be a suitable specification formalism for goals and constraints. And then formal synthesis algorithms. Um, they offer guarantees. So I take my temporal logic formula and then when I pass this into formal synthesis algorithm, what I get to um, achieve is some sort of correct by design plan, ideally, or a plan that comes with guarantees. Um, so let's take a look at an example uh, of advanced goals and constraints specified in temporal logic so that you get a little bit of concrete idea of what we can do. Here we have an office environment, we have a robot there, we have rooms A, B, C, a bunch of chairs and desks and trees and Wi-Fi routers. And uh, maybe we want the robot to patrol all three offices, all um, to keep patrolling them. Then I can use an LTL formula that will say always, eventually A, always eventually B, always eventually C. In other words, you will infinitely many times want to visit A, B, and C offices. Uh, another thing we might want from this robot is that whenever it spots a danger, it should go to the staircase and wait there for all clear signal before continuing. And then I could use an LTL formula that looks like this, always whenever there is a danger, then eventually, end up in staircase and stay there un until all clear. Um, I could uh, ask the robot to recharge every 10 minutes. And then uh, I would formulate a 
metric interval temporal logic formula. Globally, eventually, between zero and 10, recharge. In other words, repeatedly recharge uh, within those 10 minutes. Uh, and then at all times, stay within five meters from the Wi-Fi router. Uh, that then I can express uh, this, uh, this task uh, or constraint with an STL formula, signal temporal logic formula that says always the distance between the robot and the router should be smaller or equal than five. So now we have advanced goals and constraints in temporal logic for this office space. Uh, if you imagine robotic applications beyond uh, office space, uh, some kind of service robot, uh, we can think about autonomous driving. And then, yes, you need to go from A to B, but you need to obey road rules. And uh, in some works around, uh, there have been road rules expressed via these temporal logics. Um, you can also think about exploration with uh, unmanned uh, aerial vehicle with a drone in an unknown space. And there your goal is to map a room, but preferably you would like to stay, stay within certain distances from the walls and certain distances from people so that they feel safe. Uh, well, um, one quite concrete way how to expand motion planning uh, to consider these LTL specifications, at least the ones building on uh, discretizations is as follows. So I take my motion planning problem, I discretize it into roadmap, and I'm going to be treating this roadmap as a deterministic transition system. My goals and constraints are specified in linear temporal logic. I'm going to translate the formula into Bihi automaton, and then I take this DTS, deterministic transition system, and the Bihi automata, I create a product, automaton, and I basically just do a graph analysis, uh, look for lasso shapes. And uh, if I find one, I project it onto an example of behavior that satisfies the LTL uh, specification. So for those who are familiar with uh, model checking, this is very much model checking, except that you don't negate your LTL formula. That means that you are not getting counterexamples. You are getting examples of behavior that satisfy the LTL formula. It's precisely what you wanted. Um, I would like to take a little detour here now, uh, zoom out and look at formal synthesis for robot planning a little bit more generally. So robot planning will not be just motion planning here. It will um, include the whole planning hierarchy from longer term missions through this mid term motion planning to short term control. Our robot uh, in its environment will be called a system and it will be modeled somehow. So if that, if that uh, model uh, happens to be quite precise, uh, it is going to be a dynamical system. Uh, and that means that it's going to be very hard to work with with, uh, with formal methods, typically. So maybe we need to first, from that model, create a simpler model, and then that objective in formal uh, in temporal logic specification, together with that simpler model, comes to this formal synthesis algorithm, and then I get either a correct by design plan or I get an answer that there is no correct by design plan. And at this point, uh, the plan may also be some sort of feedback strategy or stochastic strategy or, or anything else. It doesn't have to be just a sequence of action. And here we have a pipeline for formal synthesis for robot planning that is a little bit larger than the automata-based uh, formal synthesis for robot motion planning that I showed you. And this is a field that is quite active. It's a, it's a community that is quite active. Um, I would say that it started uh, the whole activity around 2009 when I started my PhD. And there were sem several seminal works in uh, formal synthesis for robotics that just came out. At the time, we were having mostly uh, deterministic transition system, non-deterministic transition systems, and Petrinet as those simpler models that uh, that were treated in the formal synthesis. 
we had LTL and some fragments of LTL like uh, GR1 to make that thermal synthesis uh, more efficient. Uh, and by the time I finished my PhD in 2013, this field grew a lot. We started um, uh, considering much more interesting systems like multi-agent systems, partially unknown systems, dynamic environments. In terms of objectives, we focused on temporal goals, but also additional optimization criteria and deadlines and uh, that models that were considered nonlinear and disturbances, the models that were treated in the formal synthesis framework were then uh, weighted transition systems, MDPs, and corresponding to that, um, the temporal logic specifications became probabilistic as well. People started looking into how to define user-friendly interfaces, either linguistic or graphical, to bridge the gap between saying that objective and the temp having the rigorous temporal logic specification. And uh, well, as of today, these techniques have matured. They have been applied to real robotic systems. The community started relaxing assumptions that we need on our models. And, and uh, we also started seeing much more works on spatiotemporal goals and constraints, uh, more at the control level. And we started seeing treat treatment of signal temporal logic specifications. So this formal synthesis for robot planning is very rich field. Uh, and is still growing. But today, I would like to zoom back in uh, specifically on robot motion planning and on spatial and temporal constraints. So we are coming back to the middle uh, layer of the planning hierarchy. We will just mostly look into planning motion from A to B or to satisfy an LTL formula if that's, uh, if that's of interest. And uh, the spatial and temporal constraints that uh, I will be discussing here come in two different forms. One will be the robot's capabilities itself. So the robot um, has constraints. Uh, for instance, that non holonomic robot, that car that cannot move in every single direction that you would like to. And then uh, on the specification level, spatial and temporal constraints that are given by what we desire from the robot's behavior. Okay, so let's dive in. So the motion planning with spatial temporal constraints that uh, come from robots capabilities uh, that I would like to discuss today and show you as an example of, of uh, what, uh, what you can do and what you need to think about when you think about these, uh, these type of, types of problems. Uh, will be about planning under uncertain non-holonomic constraints and LTL specifications. So yet again, this is my vehicle uh, with non-holonomic constraints. I have LTL formula. I silently uh, remove the next operator here because we are in continuous time. So, so next is a little tricky here. Uh, and we would like this car to uh, drive so that it satisfies uh, LTL spec. Uh, our approach here uh, is to design suitable feedback motion primitives and chain those primitives to satisfy LTL specification and we'll explain why. So that uncertainty and those constraints mean that when you design a motion plan and then you just say I'm going to blindly follow, follow that motion plan, you will accumulate the uncertainty as you go. So feedback means that you go a little, you look at where you actually ended up and you try to correct for your error. And then again, you go a little uh, along the plan that you created, you look where you ended up and you correct for that potential error. Uh, the suitable feedback motion primitives uh, that we proposed uh, are called safe multi-step feedback motion primitives. What we do is basically divide the input space into regions and linearize. That linearization is there so that we can control. And uh, that linearization actually introduces even more error, even more uncertainty. So when I start going with my robot, 
unless I correct uh, for what I'm doing, the error is going to grow. And uh, my PhD student, Puri Atashvari, did very good work here um, by showing that you cannot correct for that error in one time step, but you can do that in k time steps, uh, where k is at most the number of dimensions of the system that you consider. So this is great because after k steps, what happens is that my uncertainty is actually smaller than the uncertainty I started from. With these safe multi-step feedback motion primitives, we were able to uh, do things like unpark a uh, non-holonomic vehicle from a very tight parking spot. Uh, and now, since we know how to tame the error, it's very suitable to chain these motion primitives into longer term behaviors because I will tame the error more and more. And uh, that means that we can look into motion planning with a library of feedback motion primitives. Uh, here, what we do is that system is going to be now represented by these motion primitives and that objective, the LTL specification is going to be still translated into bookie automaton. Uh, and it goes into what I call here a modified A star, um, an algorithm that uh, tries to find those lasso shapes uh, efficiently. Now, this is not an easy thing to do. Uh, this is also something that takes quite a while. So to guide that A star, to inform it, Puria designed uh, backward reachability trees that um, basically take the regions of interest. You design a backward reachability tree from each of them, and you end up having, a, uh, having an estimate how long it takes to move between these. And he took those, put it onto the bookie automaton, and uh, created weights that then serve as heuristics in this modified A star search. Uh, and by that, we were able to design a correct uh, by design plan or realize that the bow motion primitives that we have uh, cannot do so. They are not good enough to, to create such a plan and then we can refine the motion primitives. Um, so we can cut them and make them finer. And instead of saying left or right, we can say slightly left and a lot left and slightly right and a lot to the right. Um, our results, uh, when we uh, implemented this onto that non-holonomic system and the LTL formula that was to visit uh, these seven regions of interest look like this. Here, we were able to get a, about 10 times faster than uh, state-of-the-art non-holonomic uh, uh, planning for LTL specifications. And as far as we know, we are the first ones who were able to bring this to 3D on a fixed wing drone. So from this part, I think that the main takeaway is that motion planning and control, when it comes to um, highly uncertain nonlinear systems, uh, it's very entangled. You have to think about control when you think about motion planning. And uh, it is difficult, it is computationally challenging. So you have to use some domain knowledge to uh, guide your search for the motion plan. Uh, as for this part, and uh, then uh, we can take a look at uh, motion planning with spatial and temporal constraints that come from the specification that uh, we actually, uh, the users of, of robots, uh, impose these spatial and temporal constraints. So what we desire from robots behavior and here, we will take a look at motion planning for nonlinear systems with time bounded MITL specifications. So right now I'm expanding my LTL with intervals A to B, uh, that B is not infinity, it's a, uh, it's a natural number, so they are time bounded. Um, and the question is how can I make for a motion plan that will uh, have these time bounded as explicit time bounds. Uh, the approach is very much similar. We need to design suitable local feedback controllers because we have these 
this nonlinear system with uncertainty. And then we want to chain them to satisfy time bounded MITL specifications. This time, those suitable local feedback controllers have to also guarantee some kind of time bound. And uh, for that, we used controllers based on time varying control barrier functions. These are actually guaranteed to remain in an obstacle free polygon and end up epsilon close to the goal at a given time. So that at a given time is, uh, is very important here because that will allow us to chain multiple of these local feedback controllers and have the control of how long this will take. Uh, now the price that we pay for this is uh, a little bit on the side of what kind of systems we can treat like this. Um, we have to have a little bit uh, more restrictive class of nonlinear systems with, uh, with um, uncertainty than we had before. Nevertheless, uh, we can still uh, do some something for a nonlinear system. Now, if we want to chain those local feedback uh, controllers and integrate the motion planning and control with, uh, with uh, this uh, MITL metric interval temporal logic specifications, what we do is that we take the formula and we translate it into a timed automaton. We abstract the time away into a zone automaton. And then we take labeled workspace. Those labels are exactly the atomic propositions that are used in the MITL formula. And the labeled workspace together with the zone automaton, we uh, do motion planning on that. Uh, that's good. We get a path that sort of gives us good ordering of the events, but it doesn't give us yet when these events should happen. And for that, uh, from that path that we get from, from uh, this motion planning or path planning, we feed it into LP solver together with MITL formula and ask that LP solver to compute for us when should things happen. So from the LP solver, we get a timed path. And that, that timed path, together with the system dynamics and a sequence of obstacle-free polytopes that comes as a side product of the, of the motion planning, comes to a hybrid controller, and that gives us the actual trajectory for the robot. So how does it look like? Uh, let's, uh, let's see in this example. Here I have a, uh, here I have a system. Um, we start in this bottom right corner and uh, we would like to reach A within five to 10 uh, seconds, and we would like to reach B within 15 to 20 seconds. First of all, the path is computed, it's just the red dots. Uh, then for each of these red dots, from the LP solver, we get the time, uh, the time when this red dot should be visited. Then we pass these polygons with the times onto the local uh, controllers, the local feedback controllers based on the barrier functions. And then we just chain everything together. And when we look at the evolution of uh, the X, Y position here over time, we see that at exactly 10 seconds, A was visited and exactly B, uh, uh, 15 seconds B was visited. So this formula is indeed satisfied. So the takeaway from this part is that uh, even if you have time bounds, specific time bounds, uh, it is possible to, to uh, do something. But again, you have to think about the controller very much and you have to include that controller in your planning and uh, the existence of the right local feedback controllers is something that uh, is mandatory uh, for the whole motion planning to work. Now, uh, I'm going to move to the last part, and that is motion planning with uh, spatial temporal pre preferences given in signal temporal logic. So here, uh, 
it looks just like MITL, but here we have uh, this predicate instead of uh, instead of atomic propositions, we have this um, predicate uh, mu that is essentially a function of a signal of a trajectory compared to zero. Uh, so signal temporal logic is something that comes with quantitative semantics. So far, all of the uh, specifications that we considered could be satisfied or not, but signal temporal logic has a very natural quantitative semantics that tells us to what extent um, to what extent a formula is satisfied. So here, for instance, we will take a look at right time robustness as a as a quantitative evaluation of STL formula. What I'm looking here at is a um, formula that says that um, that within one second, the distance to the point B should be zero. So basically the trajectory should, should get to the point B in one uh, in less than one second. Okay. So when I look at the green one, leftmost one, that will take something like three seconds. And I am two seconds too late to reach B. When I look at the blue one, let's say that this one takes two seconds and I'm still one second too late to reach that uh, B. And when I take a look at the rightmost one, the, the red one, uh, there, let's say that the duration of the trajectory to get to B is 0 0.9 seconds. And that means that I could have been 0 0.1 seconds slower and it would still be satisfied. So this time robustness is telling me how much I could have, should have shifted uh, my time to make that formula uh, satisfied. At the same time, signal temporal logic has a notion of spatial robustness. So here we take a look at a formula that says, always the distance to obstacles should be greater than one. Uh, when I look at the first uh, trajectory, the green one, I still have half meter that up I could have been closer. So this is uh, satisfied and the robustness is 0 0.5. In the, in the middle picture, in the second one, uh, the blue trajectory, the robustness is 0 0.1 because um, I was 1.1 meter from the obstacle. I wanted to be one meter. So that means that I still have those 10 centimeters extra that I could have been closer and it would have been fine. Whereas in the third picture, in the red one, uh, the trajectory is way too close and it's 70 centimeters too close. I should have been 70 centimeters further. The formula is not satisfied and uh, the robustness is minus 0 0.7. So now I have time robustness, I have spatial robustness for STL formulas. And that means that when I take a look at three trajectories in, in an environment, uh, attempting to satisfy uh, satisfy a formula like this, I can get uh, various time and spatial robustness for this. And my question is, which one do you prefer? Do you prefer the one that goes further from obstacles, but takes a little longer? Or do you, want, do you prefer the one that cut, cuts corner? It doesn't feel so safe. So um similar feelings we could have for instance when we drive a car on a on a on a road uh if you are a defensive driver you will probably keep your distance and you will probably keep things safe and it's going to take you a little longer if you are aggressive driver you will probably risk it and this SDL uh, has a way to give us, um, is a way to specify preferences for us, uh, depending on where you value mo more the time or the spatial robustness. But the, uh, the question is how to uh, put it all together. 
So what we did is that we designed a cost function for uh, STL constraints. Uh, let's say that our goal is uh, given in syntactically co-safe LTL. So for simplicity, we will just be working with syntactically co-safe. And that means that uh, you can decide in finite time whether an LTL formula is satisfied or not. This will be called minimal prefix. And no matter how you extend this minimal prefix, uh, the, uh, the formula will be satisfied. So we will be working with this minimal prefix. And when I say globally in defining these spatial preferences, uh, I will be referring to the minimal prefix only. So I will have a safety fragment of STL2 to uh, express our constraints or spatial preferences. Uh, that will say that always some spatial preferences need to be satisfied on the prefix. And we propose a cost function that puts it together. It is a sum of the trajectory length, so of, of the length of the minimal prefix and then some violation cost. And that violation cost uh, is composed from the time robustness time, times some weight. And that weight has a little bit of that spatial robustness and two user defined parameters, A and alpha. So the user has here a way to influence the cost function. Very intuitively, uh, loosely speaking, Alpha is giving me the hard bounds, uh, and A is giving me how much I, how much more I care if I start violating more. So this is giving me sort of like slope of of how much I I uh, care about the spatial preference violation. Now the good news about this is that now we massage the uh, the temporal robustness and the spatial robustness into one single cost function uh, that is uh, with user-defined parameters. And we can merge it with RT star to come up with plans that are probably least violating or maximally satisfying with respect to that STL preference. So you remember RT star, that was the algorithm that, uh, that was doing motion planning from A to B, it was sampling based. It was iterative. Iteratively, it was improving the path. Uh, so we were incrementally building a weighted tree. Now we are incrementally we uh, building some sort of weighted product automaton. Uh, instead of incrementally updating the shortest path, now we are going to be incrementally updating the minimally violating path with respect to our STL specification. And the optimality criterion used to be distance, and now it's going to be that cost function. So what we get out of this is uh, results like this. Here I see a um, um, bunch of different motion plans for different uh, settings of A. We fix the alpha. And we also see RT star. And RT star when we inflated obstacles. So in Cyan, uh, in this blue green, that's RT star. You see that it goes very fast. It goes very close by the obstacles. Uh, when we inflate the obstacles, that's this uh, magenta uh, trajectory. It's it's just imagine that each obstacle is a little bit uh, larger. The trajectory goes close by these inflated obstacles. Uh, and then when we play with tuning these A parameters, we get different trajectories. So this is our way to uh, incorporate user preferences. And in fact, the two videos with the two uh, vehicles, the defensive and aggressive style drivers, these were automatically generated by our STL RT star algorithms with different tuning of A and alpha parameters. Now, so far with this STL, we were looking at constraints that were kind of like, keep me away from things. But I want to show you also an instance where keep me close to something was a constraint or a preference that we, that we wanted to uh, incorporate. So at some point, uh, we started talking to real roboticists, people who actually do uh, autonomous exploration in 
unknown spaces. They have these real UAVs and they fly around and, and gather data. And uh, they had this beautiful algorithm called Autonomous Exploration Planner. It works very well. And basically the principle was that it was always sending the UAV in an unknown space to the next point where, uh, where you could uh, uh, get some more information. Uh, it was doing the job very well. The, the maps were coming up uh, pretty fast with very big coverage, but the trajectories that were coming uh, from the algorithms look like this, a little bit disorganized and erratic. And we thought, okay, what if we put an STL constraint on top of it uh, to make the trajectories just like more organized and, and easier to look at and more explainable or whatnot. So um, here we said, okay, the interesting stuff is actually to map is actually around the walls. So let's require through that STL specification, the robot to stay close to STL, uh, to, to the walls. Uh, that's what we did. And this is the trajectories that we were getting. Uh, we, implemented, uh, we implemented it in, uh, in the UAVs uh, and uh, let it run in the, in the lab. And it turns out that not only the trajectories look a little neater, uh, the algorithm is not slower and it does not give uh, uh, worse coverage. In contrast, it actually in empty room and also in a real office, it gives us a little bit better performance. So this is where we actually used formal methods to help a real completely different robotics problem. So uh, with this, I would like to start wrapping up slowly. Um, and I hope that you get you get some insights into um, what we need to think about when we think about formal methods for robot motion planning, what are all the challenges that we have uh, that we have in robotics uh, that um, uh, that uh, the robots are things with dynamics that um, uh, and so on. So the, the um, takeaway is that temporal logics uh, can be used for specification of advanced goals and constraints because they are rich, rigorous, and they have some resemblance to natural language. And that this uh, formal synthesis algorithms offer us some guarantees. Uh, now, together, temporal logics and formal synthesis, um, they also offer us some sort of generality or universality because when we want to do robot motion planning uh, and we put it in a particular domain and we have constraints, what we want to do is have some sort of systematic way to treat these constraints. We don't want to go and fine tune that motion planning algorithm every single time to that specific domain and to that specific constraint. So this is something good uh, for, for the roboticist. And, uh, I want to add two more R's to Bauder van Haverkort's R's from, from Tuesday. And that is remember resources and robots. So remember that whatever you do here uh, needs to be done efficiently, uh, needs to be done so that it can be actually implemented on the robot because behind all of this is uh, an actual system and uh, an actual application need. And that the robot uh, has its constraints on its own. So even if you find a motion plan that looks very pretty in discrete space, you have to make sure that it gets to be uh, implemented by robot down there. And with that, I would really like to thank you for listening. And uh, thanks goes, of course, to my uh, group, especially to Puria, Fernando, and Jesper, my PhD students who have spent a lot on, on this and uh, to the funding bodies that are willing to fund our research. So thank you very much for listening. All right, thank you, Jana, for the very interesting talk. Um, so this is a good time for Q&A. So I invite everybody to post their questions either on, on the chat or just raise hands and I'll, I'll 
uh, unmute them and let them just uh, orally ask their questions. There's already one question, but before I get to that, uh, I have a question for you. Um, so we know that one of the bottlenecks uh, of applying these formal methods in, in robotics or general and continuous dynamical systems is um, abstraction, finding an abstraction, mm -hmm. it's some sort of cryptic structure, if you don't go the STL route, obviously. Um, so in your work, in the first couple of projects that you talked about, uh, that you do perform abstraction, especially for these uh, nonlinear systems and you do linearization with some error. Can you elaborate more on the difficulty of the abstraction, how much time it takes, how scalable it is? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So that is for sure. So when I look at, at the result that we got there, uh, the linearization was for sure the bottleneck of, of the whole thing. Um, it's still, um, yeah, you are completely right. That's the bottleneck. But uh, do you have any better idea <laughs> how to how, how to tame these things so far? Uh, yeah. No, no, it, it is. I was just wondering if you could elaborate on, on uh, like, computation times I took to yeah, create that sure. abstraction for those examples, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, it took, a, let's say it took a couple minutes to, to come up with, uh, with the linearization and uh, we were able to go to uh, 3D, the fixed wing drone, but we were not able to go beyond that when we considered the crazy non-holonomic constraints and non-linearity and, and disturbances, but that, that was an attempt to uh, consider as complex systems as, as possible. The simpler systems we get, then we can use some um, assumptions and all of these things get uh, get much easier, as you know. So uh, yeah, so so far uh, that's, that's uh, as far as we can go, just 3D. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. All right, so the first question that is posted uh, is, uh, I think, regarding the uh, MITL project. And uh, the question is, was the choice of bounded fragment of MITL a design choice or the framework only works with this fragment? Um, so I think, uh, so, so far, we have not tried to extend it to unbounded MITL, I think uh, it was basically, uh, the consideration was basically to make the, uh, make the whole presentation of the thing simpler. Uh, I think that also one of our motivations there was that I do not really care if a robot does something in infinity. I kind of want to give it a deadline. So is this, is this balance between what is uh, practical what is actually desired and what we can compute. And uh, the experience from, from working with robotics is, is that very often we offer them this huge hammer and they're like, I would like this piece. Um, I never consider anything anything bigger or anything more complex than, than this piece. And then we can put a lot of, um, a lot of assumptions that will make our lives easier. So this was a similar um, case here that uh, no one cares that the robot does something in infinity. They want to have a deadline on that. And that made our life easier in presenting everything. But I'm, um, I'm thinking that there is not much of a reason why this shouldn't be uh, extendable to full MITL if we wanted to. Yeah. All right, great, thanks. Um, there is a... Another question, the question is, are there description languages for specifying robot planning problems? How easy or difficult is it to utilize temporal logics for robot planning? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. So I think that there are a couple of them uh, there, but uh, there is nothing that would be general because every robotics problem I think is very different. So when I consider the drone flying in an unknown space. Uh, and when I consider a humanoid robot walking in an office, and when I consider an autonomous car, it's such a different, uh, different setup that I don't have a single tool where I would draw this. Um, so that is for, for specifying the domain. Uh, it's, it's 
tough. It's very, uh, it's very domain specific when it comes to, uh, to specifying a temporal logic uh, specifications. I think for instance, LTL MOP tool that uh, Hadas Quest Gazette has developed uh, is a very nice tool to try to start playing with this because there is this uh, interface between um, structured English and LTL. So you can put in structured English and, and, uh, and it gets translated to an LTL formula and, and then the tool works with the LTL formula. Uh, there are a couple uh, tools that I have seen around that work more with patterns. So you have these patterns uh, of LTL and then you choose which pattern of LTL formula and you just fill in the blanks in terms of atomic propositions. Um, how difficult is it to utilize the temporal logics for robot planning? That question to me equals how difficult it is to convince a roboticist that it's worth it. So, so uh, uh, I think um, the um, complexity really comes from, from uh, making the point and, uh, and the bridging the two communities and explaining that there is a merit to it uh, in general, yeah. All right. Yeah, it, it is challenging. Actually, uh, so actually, this is a very good follow up question, and you partly touched on it already. In your work of bridging formal methods with control theory, what is the biggest challenge? Mm -hmm. I think it's the priorities of the communities. It's what the communities appreciate. So there is control theory and formal methods and also robotics and every community has a little bit different tradition and a little bit different style and appreciation for things. So it took me ages to figure out that, that what went through quite nicely in control conferences with my small MATLAB simulations has zero chance to succeed at robotics uh, conferences where people want to see like real robot and, and real implementation. And, and then uh, it also started partially explaining why different communities publish differently, cite differently, while uh, why control theory appreciates journals so much as opposed to conferences and so on. So um, yeah, so I think that, that uh, being in the middle means trying to understand what, what, uh, what uh, people want. That's, that's the toughest part for me, I think. All right, um, so next question is about like broadening the horizon a little bit. Have you considered game models with mm -hmm. adversarial environment or with uncertainties modeled as an adversary? The plan would be a strategy. Uh, yes, so uh, not in, uh, uh, in the type of work that I've presented, but we have considered and, and the whole formal synthesis for a robotics community have considered it. Morteza is one of the people that you should talk to about, uh, about these things. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, that is a thing. It's a, it's a big thing. Uh, it's uh, not more on the motion planning level. I think that usually it goes a little bit more on the, on the mission planning level or decision-making level. Motion planning uh, as going from A to B in an environment, just like focusing on the motion. Uh, it's a little bit, but more on the decision-making level. All right, so I think uh, this would be the last uh, question since we only have a few seconds, about 20 seconds left. Um, so an obvious side effect of using two level approach, combining motion, motion parameters with a formal, uh, with a form of graph and automata based planning, combining these is a certain jerkiness uh, of, the, of the resulting trajectory. Mm -hmm. Unless moving to a higher dimensional situation space, mm -hmm. which comes with the obvious complexity penalty in planning path or trajectories. How would one reconcile these mm -hmm. given the dimensionality of approximately three uh, three dimensions seems kind of a current bound on dimensionality of the planning space. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've got to digest this a little. Uh, so, um, uh, right. Um, 
I think the, uh, so, so uh, for instance, in that work that went to three dimensions, uh, the one with the feedback motion primitives, we did not experience the jerkiness there uh, uh, because uh, of how the controller was designed because it was so robust that uh, that uh, we did not really experience it in practice there. But for sure, in general, this is an issue. And uh, I have to say that uh, I don't um, have a good answer. Uh, so I, <laughs> I would uh, love to follow up uh, on, on that and, uh, and discuss some All more. Right. So with that, we come to the end of this keynote session. And once again, thank you, Jana, for a very, very interesting talk and, and uh, broadening our horizon and how we view the field, especially after finding applications of formal methods in other communities. And thank you all for attending and your nice questions and um, enjoy the last couple of days of the conference. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.